Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Hello and welcome to Aggravating Adaptations, in which I take a look at the subject and examine why it fails to properly examine the themes, questions, and messages of a original source which deserve much better. For this episode, I would like to clarify right off the bat that the subject is not necessarily bad overall, it's just that it fails as an adaptation. Minority Report. So the basic... One of the central elements of the short story and why it's such an important short story, why it is something that we need to keep thinking about is the short story really perfectly highlights the problem with pre-crime or thought crime, whatever exact term you want to use. The, when a crime has not yet been committed, there is no case, there is no defense. You can't prove that someone did something because they didn't actually do it, and thus you also can't prove that they weren't going to do it, because how would you? If something has actually been done, yeah, you can, you can prove that it was done, and you can determine to a certain extent, at least, whether it's likely that it was this particular person who did it, but when you just have a, a vision that this this is going to happen that's yeah and in this film basically what it comes down to is a typical mystery plot of a police figure of authority is you know using his power to cover something up and that's that essentially could be completely... You, you could remove the entire element of pre-crime from this movie and still keep the overall crime and cover-up intact. It could easily just be a, a completely regular police investigation where someone fiddled around with some evidence. It has nothing to do with pre-crime necessarily, and the, the problem with pre-crime is not that someone in power could fiddle with it and fake it and, and cover up. The problem is that you're, you're convicting someone of something that they haven't actually done. The, and it doesn't help either that the movie's plot is remarkably convoluted to where it I don't think anybody believes that something like that could actually happen in real life that th this tremendous extent to which the the authority figure goes to cover up what actually happened the there's there's a I'm, I, I want to stay a little on the on the pre-crime thing with another one of, one of the issues again with this convicting for something that hasn't actually happened is that when it has happened there might be mitigating circumstances there might be a situation where someone you know, felt that they were in danger, and the, the precogs don't see that. They don't see the why. They just see, or if, if to put it another way, if they see it, they don't say it. It doesn't come out to the, the in, you know, investigators, I don't even want to call them that, the, the, the cops who are chasing down the pre-crime suspect. It doesn't it doesn't come through there, so, yeah, and the, I 
suppose I, I'll just briefly describe, you know, basically in the movie what we have is that there's, there's really not that much of a... There's not a lot of doubt as to, you know, properly raised doubt, uh, anyway, to, as to if these many people, you know, captured were basically innocent and if it was, you know, if it could have gone some other way. The, you know, we, we only focus on a few people, basically Anderson who was framed and that guy in the beginning with the scissors who it was pretty clear who was going to do it. So there's really no, yeah, we, we don't have much of a reason to doubt that it, that, that what the, the precog see is, is accurate. In fact, in the film, they rely very much upon it with the, the, the scene where he gets, Anderton gets through you know, the, the, the mall or whatever it is with, with these insta-visions, the help of Agatha. And really the... Yeah, so, so basically the, the one place where you could maybe doubt that it's, you know, clearly Anderton didn't really kill that guy. It was sort of suicide by cop kind of thing. I mean, the guy very nearly pulled the trigger himself. It, there, it's... Yeah. Like, this is again why the, the film really fails to convey this. That doesn't happen that often, I'm sorry, but someone standing there and basically, you know, yeah, it's, it's essentially him committing suicide. It just so happens that the gun is in Anderton's hand. Anderton doesn't want to do it at all. And Perhaps the film is trying to make this point that even that is seen as, ah, murder, you know, by the, the precogs. But again, that, that just doesn't happen that often. So you, you really can't extrapolate from that that a lot of these people were just innocents and it was just these ridiculous situations that kept happening. Now, with that firmly established, the f that's how the film does it. In the short story, basically, when Anderton finds out that he is supposed to kill this person, he tries to disprove it so that he will remain a free man. He, he does what he can to yeah, to avoid getting in into that situation, so that, yeah, and, and if he disproves the system, okay, so it, you know, that, that means the end of pre-crime, but he will still be a free man. That's, that's how he's thinking. So, what we there have is that it brings up the question of, can you just tell someone that they're going to commit a crime and then they won't. That'll, that'll shake them back to reality. That will make them change their mind because really a lot of crime, a lot of really horrible things are done by people in heightened emotional states, in extreme states of, of mind or emotion. It doesn't... It... it it's less common than you might think that people just, you know, wake up and decide, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm gonna do this and then put a lot of planning into it and never actually come back out of it. There are people who do that, but then they are either, yeah, again, you know, they might be desperate, that they might feel like that's the only way they can get by, or they are... In, in some way deranged and these so so yeah that that question is brought up it's not for me to to answer I the Philip Dick wanted you to think about that for yourself and I agree with him completely think about that for yourself it's not for I'm I'm not gonna stand here and tell you what to think about that it's just that's the interesting question could you tell someone 
that they're going to do this and would they then still. The, the short story brings up these, these themes of free will versus determinism, which the movie really doesn't particularly go into. It, Basically, the, the, the short story has Anderson going from finding out he's going to kill someone and, and reacting to that with, I would never kill someone. There is there's no situation in which I would ever kill someone, so clearly I'm being set up. And I, I have to disprove it by staying away and just staying safe for these several days until the supposed murder will have happened and then th that ends it. And then at the end of the story, he does actually kill. And th there we have very, very beautifully set up this, this free will and determinism conflict. At first, you have the free will of Anderton is told he will do something, and then he refuses to. And then at the end of the story, he does go through with what he was told at the start that he would do. So we have both very present, and you could argue for both positions quite well for, from the short story. Whereas in the film, they, they do bring up, you know, oh, how do, I, how do I avoid killing this man that I've never met? But then when he, when he has a chance to walk away, when he has a chance, when he recognizes and sees this is where I will supposedly kill a man, he doesn't walk away. He just, he goes in and walks right into it. And I'm not saying that it's necessarily bad writing. I'm not saying his character wouldn't do that in the film. I'm saying it's not very interesting. The, the, the interesting conflict is can you really go against something like that? It, determinism, again, very much it's, it's vital to this way of thinking, the, the, the pre-crime, thought-crime kind of thing. I'm not going to get too political here, but a lot of people look at certain groups of people and say, you know, based, based on ethnicity, based on social status, they will probably end up doing something wrong. They, they might not have done anything yet, but they probably will. And there you have d determinism. If, if you keep telling someone that they'll end up doing something, will they will they eventually do it no matter what, or can they go against that? And that, that right there, yeah, looking, looking at a group of people and saying they'll probably do something, I wish we could put them away. That is thought crime. That is the, the essence of it. The short story merely takes that concept and says, well, let's see if, what, what happens if it's a reality. Now, the, I suppose, there's, there's really, there's more to go into as far as the, the, yeah, why, why it starts with Anderson saying he would never kill and ends with him killing. The, basically, there are, you know, there are three reports in the short story. It's not really completely mentioned if they're all, th all three of them are different in the movie, but in the short story, basically, all three of them see a different outcome. It's just the two of them have elements in common. In two of them, Anderton kills General Leo Kaplan. Originally, why the, the prediction of Anderton killing Kaplan comes out is because Kaplan abducts Anderton and 
tries to force, basically use him as a hostage or try to, tries to force him directly to shut down pre-crime because Kaplan wants more military power and that's something I'll get more into. And then in, Anderson is so determined to protect pre-crime that he is willing to kill to protect it. And when he finds out that he will supposedly kill, and again, without knowing why he supposedly killed, he's never met Kaplan when he gets the message that he will kill Kaplan. So his initial reaction is that has to be fake. He can't imagine that there is a circumstance under which he would kill. And that's what the second of the three precogs sees, that he doesn't do it. But then when he finds out about the plot and finds out that Kaplan changes his plans, basically, once he finds out that supposedly Anderson will kill him, he figures that now he won't even have to abduct Anderson. Now he'll just point to, well, see, he was supposed to kill me. You saw the report. It, it was made public by that point. And he didn't. I'm here alive. And so, yes. So, at that point, Anderson is back in the mindset that he was when he first, you know, initially in this potential outcome, killed Kaplan. And he goes ahead and kills Kaplan because he, again, is willing to kill and willing to... Basically, he, he agrees to an exile instead of going to this prison colony they have in space. I think that's the, the, the specific details, but... Yeah, he's, he's willing to give up his job and, yeah, to, to kill, to protect pre-crime, which he built in the short story. And that, that is what the third precog sees, that he kills Kaplan there in front of, uh, yeah, the, very publicly. And because of that, there are, yeah, there are these three reports, and they are different from each other. They show three different potential futures, but two of them do have that in common that Anderton kills Kaplan at a certain point in time. I believe that the exact time is even accurate, too. And because of that, the majority report should, that, that leads to the, I think it's like a little slip thing, paper, that, yeah, because of that, the thing shows that Anderson will kill Kaplan. And with that, we don't know for sure if if that's happened before, or if it could happen again, if you did take the chance of just trying with at least one suspect, just try to tell them, you will kill this person in so-and-so amount of time. Stop and really think about what you're doing, you know, see if it'll, if, if you'll really want to do that. Because, yeah, most, a lot of murders, at least, happen without the person intending to do it. They just, they get so, so caught up in their emotions, so caught up in the situation that they don't realize what they're doing until it's too late. And if you tell someone going into that situation, if you keep going, if you keep arguing with your ex, for example, you will eventually end up killing them. That might actually make you stop and, and calm back down and, and think about it. And that's something that you really get from the short story that the film doesn't at all. The, the, these different futures is barely touched upon in the film. The, the idea of knowledge of the future, meaning 
the po possibility of changing the future is is just barely they, they the film doesn't even have a minority report essentially in the film no matter what it was always going to end up with Anderton sort of killing that other guy and that really that's not even fully explained how we, we don't even know what the Max von Sydow's character what what his original plan was how he made Anderton wind up in that situation by himself and we don't even know if Agatha was always there either I don't think I don't think it's anyway whether whether or not we know whether Agatha how how exactly did Anderton end up up there with yeah with with absolutely no one else there and yeah, with with that not explained, we don't know how. Yeah, it's it's there. There was apparently no possible future where the the that murder suicide, whatever you want to call it, did not take place. It it always happened, and that again is it's such a central idea to this. The, the problem with pre-crime is, can you be sure that it would really happen that way? You, you, how can you prosecute someone for something that hasn't happened, that you only believe will happen? And with no, with no alternative outcome, that is just completely dropped. I get that it's supposed to be a twist in the film, but again, a, a major point of the short story is this whole minority report thing that when you go in depth with it, when, when Anderton really looks at all three reports, he finds out that they're very different from each other. There are some details that are the same, but really they're not. They're not the same. Now, another thing that the... Some, something that's brought up in the in the short story, which again goes into that the, the precogs don't either they don't see or at least they don't say why the murder takes place is the killing can be the lesser of two evils. And uh, again that's not at all in in the film. The the murder is not a murder at all. They, to, they, they sacrificed the, like, the, you know, to, to preserve the likability of our lead, they sacrificed that major point that the, the, because again, we only know about Anderson in both versions, but really, can we be sure that that hasn't happened before? That the, you know, could some of it be self-defense? Could some of it be that, you know, the, the, the person that they kill is about to do something much more horrible? It's, it's the would you kill Hitler ethical dilemma thing. You know, he hasn't done anything yet, but if you kill him, you know he never will. That, that is brought up excellently by the, the, the reason in both potential futures why the short stories Anderton kills Kaplan. And that brings me of course back to the the issue of military during peacetime. The in the short story, Kaplan and basically the military in general, they want power again. They they want they they, they miss the war basically because they used to have a lot of political power because when your nation is at war, the military gets to dictate a lot because the war will seem like the most important thing. I mean, okay, there's some civil rights issues here, but we're at war. If we don't take care of the war effort first and foremost, then maybe, 
you know, what will civil rights matter if you're dead by tomorrow or enslaved by this other, much more evil country? And, and so, and, and when you look at it, I'm, I'm not going to go into, I'm not saying the war is always completely wrong. Basically, my point here is some very questionable things are done during wartime. A lot of propaganda, a lot of, yeah, just because the war seems like the most important thing. And in, in some cases, it certainly is. But I suppose, just briefly to state my own position, I consider war a necessary evil. When war is completely necessary, it yes, we should fight, but it should be done as efficiently. We should not seek to prolong war, and we should not seek out war where it is not necessary. And when, yeah, when 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 a country is at war, the military enjoys that power, and they might, at least some of them, want to maintain the a, a state of eternal war. To quote Orwell, I think, and that's basically what the short story in General Kaplan wants to regain that political power and he lost it because of pre-crime because there's no you know the military doesn't need to be in charge when pre-crime prevents murders that's not at all you know why why would you why would you have a lot of big fancy guns and artillery and trained men to when all you need to do is read these slips of paper and just go get someone before they even did something. So Kaplan is seeking to discredit pre-crime initially by, well, yeah, initially he just wants to, he, he basically plans a military coup of the, of the country. And then, you know, when, when, when he finds out that supposedly Anderton will kill him, he decides to discredit them instead by proving that Anderton doesn't kill him. And that is a, a very interesting point also to make, that, to, that a, a powerful military during peacetime can be a bit of an issue because they will, you know, they might miss that power. And I, I'm not saying the military as such is a bad thing, of course. Just, again, when you don't need a military, when you're not expecting a war or you're not fighting a war, you should probably, I don't know, is the word dismantle, you know, just not have as many troops on the ready, as much artillery. It's because then, you know, and yeah, this is getting really close to getting political, but historically, when there is a lot, when there is a strong standing military and no war breaks out, a country might seek out a war. And I will leave it at that. Now, the film completely eliminates the element of the powerful military during peacetime. I will say that this is something that you could remove from the overall story. You could replace it with a different evil, you know. You, I, I do think that the, the point of you know, killing being the lesser of two evils is a very important point to make, but in any case, you could remove that aspect. However, given that the movie came out in, I'm pretty sure, 2002, after the 9-11 attacks, after the Patriot Act and the beginning, the, the war on terror was beginning, I would especially say that it's a vital element to bring, bring forth. And if, if it's too close, if it's too soon as the, yeah, then postpone the movie, make it a little later when 
the, the wound is no longer com completely fresh. But don't, don't make a movie based on a short story that points out that a large standing military might lead to starting wars when it's not necessary. Because again, this was not, we're not talking about a country attacking the US, we're talking about a group of people that don't represent the, the country attacking the US. The, there, there was, yeah, I'm not going to get into, I'm just, yeah. Now, the, I, I suppose I will end on the, the issue of how much, how much trust can be put in the precogs. In the movie, as I've already gone into some, it's essentially not challenged. The, there, there is no alternate outcome, no matter what Anderson, excuse me, Anderson ends up suicide killing that other guy. Agatha is a freaking wonder, again, getting Anderson through the mole. You know, the one time she fails is when she just yells, run, which I don't even understand why that needed to go that way, but anyway. Seems like a plot hole that she didn't protect him that time. But, in the short story, it's, it's one of the really important elements, again, that the system that they've made, the, the, the trust that they put in the precogs, it, it's at least partially flawed because you can't be sure. The, the majority report that came out said that, you know, Kaplan would end up dead at Anderton's hands. And that was in spite of the circumstances around that being vastly different. The, the basic motive was the same, and the time, and the, the two people involved. But other than that, it was very different. And that again raises questions about what if, yeah, what, what if something similar has happened before? What if there were, you know, just certain situations where, you know, let's go back to the, 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 you know, someone fighting with their ex, you know, verbally. You know, maybe in one potential outcome that ends up with one of them killing the other, but another outcome is that they just, you know, go just leave and, and nothing, you know, really bad happens, but then there is a completely different outcome where they're actually defending themselves against their ex, for example. In both cases, they're at a heightened emotional state. They're, you know, the, the, the perpetrator and the victim are the same, but this system would still not detect that these two are... Yeah, there, there are big problems with it. And the, the film, it appears, is trying to say, well, what if we did have a perfect system, there'd still be problems. And I don't think that you can just kind of say that, well, what if we had a perfect system? Well, how would, how would we ever get a perfect system? How would you ever perfectly predict the future? That, again goes back to and and is it per, in fact perhaps that's why they eliminate the idea of several potential outcomes that's why there is no minority report in the film called minority report it's because they need for the future to be forever unchanging because otherwise how could you ever have a quote unquote perfect system but the problem isn't that even if you have a perfect system, there is still human error, as the film suggests. 
the problem is that this kind of system is really, really troubling as far as... Yes, to, to, I, I suppose I will bookend this with the problem with pre-crime or thought crime is there is no crime, there is no case, and there is no defense. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.